Good morning, this is Dimitri Lascaris coming to you from Beirut, Lebanon on the morning of August 25th, 2024. Well, after three and a half weeks of waiting, Hezbollah has finally launched its retaliatory strikes on Israel. This is in response to Israel's assassination on July 31st of the top Hezbollah military commander, Fuad Shukur, here in Beirut in the southern suburb known as Dahia. And uh, the uh, action began this morning with uh, a series of drone strikes and Katyusha rocket strikes on Israel. I'm going to get into the details of that in a moment. And uh, a statement by the Israeli military that it had launched what it described as preemptive strikes in the south. So before I get into the details, I just want to deal with a preliminary matter. Um, up until now, I have not mentioned in any of my YouTube reports that I have a Rumble channel. And I've been posting my videos on Rumble, every single one of them, uh, at the same time that I post them on YouTube. And the reason why I've done that uh, is as a backup plan. Uh, one never knows uh, when, uh, for any reason, YouTube might try to deplatform me or suspend me. I don't have any indication at this stage that YouTube is thinking of doing that. But in the current repressive environment, for example, uh, the arrest of independent journalist Richard Medhurst by British police at Heathrow Airport a few days ago, under the uh, Terrorism Act of 2000. Uh, this was an extraordinary act of uh, repression of the free press. Uh, and that story uh, continues to unfold. And then this morning I learned, and this is really what for me was the final straw and why I decided I needed to start making people aware of my Rumble channel. Um, uh, I learned that uh, French police had arrested at an airport in France the uh, billionaire founder of Telegram, Pavel Durov. Uh, exactly why they did that uh, is not clear to me at all. I can't add much uh, insight into that arrest other than to say uh, that Telegram does allow a number of pro-resistance and pro-Palestinian channels to operate freely. And in fact, upon learning of his arrest, the Palestinian human rights organization Samidun put out a statement in which it condemned the arrest, expressed solidarity with Pavel Durov, and said that it believed that this arrest was motivated by a desire to force Durov to deplatform pro-resistance and pro-Palestinian channels. Uh, so after hearing about that, I thought, that's it. I need to make people aware that I have this Rumble channel. My handle on Rumble is at Dimitri Lascaris, no space, no underscoring. Um, and uh, if you like the content, if you value the work that I do, uh, please subscribe both to this channel and to that channel, just in case uh, I, for any reason, am deprived of access to my audience on YouTube. Now, with that uh, as background, uh, I also want to give you an update on how I ended up in Beirut. Those of you who have been following my reporting over the last few days will know that I've been in the south of Lebanon. Uh, and I was down there for about four days with Lebanese journalist Hadi Hotet, who acted as my guide. Um, and uh, on the final night, which was last night, uh, not last night, the night before, I should say, uh, so that would have been on Friday night, Hadi and I stayed in a private residence atop Mount Safi, which is a, the southernmost mountain uh, in Lebanon, uh, or at least major mountain. It's about 1,300 meters tall. Uh, we were at a height of about 1,100 meters, uh, overlooking the, the whole of South Lebanon and significant parts of northern occupied Palestine. We could also see the Mediterranean coastline from there. This mountain, Mount Safi, uh, is uh, extremely important to the resistance and uh, over the years has been uh, attacked repeatedly by Israel because it offers, uh, it is uh, of strategic importance in terms of, uh, uh, you know, being able to uh, provide uh, uh, an overview of northern occupied Palestine, south southern Lebanon, and also to provide, I would imagine, uh, just having been there and seen it with my own eyes, uh, considerable cover for resistance fighters uh, when they are in periods of combat with the Israeli military. In any event, we were there uh, for about 24 hours on Mount Safi. We saw one, uh, what appeared to be one airstrike in the distance. Um, uh, that would have been yesterday uh, in the early afternoon. And we also heard uh, drones throughout the day yesterday when we were atop Mount Safi. Uh, but there was no uh, unusual activity. Uh, that was entirely normal, what we saw for the last 10 months. Uh, and then we left for reasons that were unrelated uh, to um, you know, our anticipation of an attack. We didn't know when uh, an attack was going to come and what it would look like. Uh, it was just purely by happenstance that we left uh, South Lebanon yesterday at about um, 7.30 p.m. And then uh, at dawn this morning, as I say, the retaliatory strikes began. 
Now, uh, the first I learned of this was not from uh, Hezbollah or from uh, a newspaper or media outlet reporting on Hezbollah's retaliatory strikes. It was rather uh, from media reports that Israel had launched what it described as preemptive strikes on various positions in South Lebanon. And in fact, it launched uh, 40 strikes approximately. This was uh, unprecedented. I think that is the largest number of airstrikes Israel has launched on South Lebanon uh, in the last 10 months uh, since the genocide in Gaza began. Um, and uh, what later emerged after uh, Hezbollah had had an opportunity to respond to the statements from the Israeli military is that in fact these strikes according to the Islamic resistance were not preemptive at, at all. Uh, in fact, they were uh, launched by Israel according to the Islamic resistance after the Islamic resistance um, uh, began to attack Israel on a large scale. Uh, and uh, according to the Islamic resistance, there's a false narrative circulating in the Israeli media that these so-called preemptive strikes disrupted the attacks uh, by the Islamic resistance and uh, they had intended to strike Tel Aviv uh, and they were not able to strike Tel Aviv because of the disruption of these attacks. Hezbollah says, that, uh, and you know, who's, who's telling the truth here? I leave that to you to decide. But Hezbollah says this is all nonsense, there, nor was there an intention for them to launch a thousand or more rockets, which apparently is what the Israeli media is also claiming. In any event, what uh, does Hezbollah say about the attacks that it launched? It uh, states that it attacked, uh, I think it's about 11 or 12 military bases in Israel. I believe all of them are in the north of Israel, uh, or at least most of them are in the north of Israel, and in the Golan Heights, which is occupied Syrian territory. Um, and it also launched, in addition to dozens of attack drones, about 320 Katusha rockets. Uh, as of yet, I have not seen any statement by Hezbollah uh, that it used in this series of strikes uh, any of its heavier rockets and longer range rockets. Uh, the Katusha rockets are kind of the go-to rockets that it employs. They're not particularly long range and they don't pack an enormous explosive punch. Uh, certainly Hezbollah has more formidable missiles in its arsenal. At least we have every reason to believe that. Uh, and for whatever reason, it appears to have refrained at this point from having used them. Um, the uh, interesting thing about this is, uh, as I read the statements of Hezbollah, and there's some ambiguity here, um, although it says that the first stage of its retaliation has been completed, it's not entirely clear whether this is going to continue. It seems that at least for today, uh, based upon its statements, it isn't going to continue to launch. Uh, it, it has completed this phase, what it calls the first phase of its retaliation. But it seems to be suggesting that uh, there is more to come in terms of retaliation. And uh, we're probably going to learn more later today when uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah is going to make a speech, Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, it has been announced by Hezbollah. will talk about this retaliatory strike at some point later today. Uh, and perhaps then we'll get more clarity on whether there is more to come. But my read at this stage is that there is more to come. And of course, one open question is not only whether there's more to come and what more to come there will be. Uh, but there is also a question about whether subsequent phases of this attack, this retaliatory attack, should there be subsequent phases, will be coordinated with attacks from Iran. For the time being, I've seen no reports today that Iran has launched any attacks uh, on Israel, uh, although I can't uh, imagine that it isn't uh, apprised of what Hezbollah is doing and had advance notice of what Hezbollah, Hezbollah is doing and is, is at least coordinating with Hezbollah behind the scenes. Uh, so that's, this is a question which remains uh, to be resolved. What is Iran going to do, if anything? My own belief is that Iran will strike and it will strike significantly harder than it struck Israel last time uh, because I believe that Iran feels it has no other alternative. Uh, and, um, and in fact, it has declared that that's precisely what it's going to do. And having declared that it is going to respond severely to the assassination of Ismail Hania in Tehran, apparently by Israel, having declared that, uh, I think that uh, Iran's military and uh, government would lose a considerable amount of credibility if it didn't carry out that threat. I think the only scenario in which it wouldn't carry out that threat is if uh, the Blinken uh, Sullivan administration, as Carlin Nixon calls it, um, uh, puts an end to the genocide in Gaza, 
uh, by forcing, using its considerable leverage over Israel finally to stop the slaughter of Palestinian civilians in the Gaza concentration camp. Uh, but there's no indication that that's going to happen. In fact, Blinken, as many of you will know, he came to Israel in what he described as a last ditch effort uh, and perhaps the final and only remaining effort to secure a ceasefire deal and the release of the hostages. Uh, and he's left with no deal in hand. And the Israeli media has reported that uh, Netanyahu is making demands that Hamas cannot accept. For example, that Israel remain in control of uh, the Philadelphia corridor, corridor in the Gaza concentration camp, which borders upon Egypt. And let's be very clear here that the International Court of Justice has ruled that Israel's, Israel is occupying Gaza, not just the West Bank, and that the uh, occupation of all Palestinian territories is illegal. So Israel has no entitlement whatsoever to maintain control of any inch of the Gaza concentration camp, which is occupied territory. And Hamas's demand, the demand of all Palestinian resistance groups, this isn't just Hamas, this is all the Palestinian factions, are demanding that Israel's forces be completely withdrawn from Gaza. Uh, that is their right under international law. There's nothing unreasonable about it. Israel seems to have absolutely no interest in satisfying that demand or in ensuring uh, that if it gets the hostages back, it will not resume its attacks on Gaza, which is another very important point. Uh, why would uh, why would the Palestinians in Gaza give up their uh, hostages when Israel uh, maintains custody over thousands of Palestinian hostages? We don't call them that in the West, but that's precisely what they are. Uh, many of them not charged with any uh, kind of offense, held in administrative detention, many of them undergoing torture, uh, as numerous human rights organizations have uh, documented. So why would Hamas and the other Palestinian resistance groups in Gaza give up their hostages when Israel continues to have thousands of Palestinians in its custody, brutalizing them, and will give no assurance that it isn't going to resume the slaughter in Gaza. Uh, so it's quite clear, I think, uh, and I've been saying this for months, as have, uh, as have many other observers, that Israel, uh, its government, has absolutely no interest in any kind of a durable ceasefire. Uh, and that being the case, uh, it seems to me uh, highly likely that Iran will launch at some point a heavy retaliatory strike on Israel. In any case, that's uh, what I have to tell, tell you at this time. Uh, I may have more to say later today. I'm going to be trying to have a conversation about all of this with geopolitical analyst Laith Marouf, uh, who's uh, been recovering from a health issue. He's doing better. Uh, he tells me that he is available now to uh, uh, engage with me in a discussion about all of this. Uh, if I can find the time to do that later today, I will certainly do that. But right now I'm focused on getting uh, out to you uh, my uh, final two or three reports from the South, including a very, uh, I think, uh, compelling account of what has happened in the border vill village of Aita Ash Shab. Uh, this is about a 15 minute report, which I hope to publish shortly uh, and uh, to give you some insight into the extraordinary destruction uh, that Israel has uh, visited upon uh, that fiercely uh, proud and resistant community on the border of Lebanon and northern occupied Palestine. For now, this is Dmitry Laskaris signing off from Beirut, Lebanon on August 25th, 2024.